ไปเนาะ
And so I thought it would be nice for you to get a chance to meet our new community paramedic, uh, Mr. Dalton Barrett. He's got a presentation he wants to share. I also want to introduce uh, Mr. Antoine Brown, who is our emergency services director. Um, and uh, Dalton reports to Antoine. So. Your, your clicker is up here. Okay. It's already been ready. Good deal. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, hopefully, you haven't seen me before because if that were the case, I'd usually be on the ambulance or something like that. Uh, thankfully, um, you know, with the opioid settlement and such, I've got a great career opportunity for me, uh, but also a great opportunity uh, for the citizens of Edgefield County, which we serve. Uh, we really have a, a unique program uh, specific to Edgefield County to basically just help people where they are. Um, community care medicine is basically kind of a, a, new, a new type thing. Um, it started in the 90s out west. Uh, basically it addressed um, needs such as folks with chronic health disorders that were being transported to the hospital, really becoming taxing on the local EMS systems, the hospital systems and such, without really getting to the root problems. Um, one of the examples uh, was out in Red River in New Mexico. They were almost 40 miles away from the local hospital. So when they tied up an ambulance, that ambulance was out of service for close to three hours. Uh, so we can kind of see how that produces a problem for the local community. Uh, and with those patients who had issues with hypertension, alcohol abuse in that particular area, they weren't really getting care for their root problem. So they were just going to the hospital, they were shipping them back, and then the kind of the cycle would repeat. Uh, the way that the community addressed that problem was to set up their version of community paramedicine, which takes uh, paramedics, uh, cross-trains them almost as like primary care providers in a sense, and allows them to do an increased scope of practice and go out to the community that really didn't have any type of clinic, no pharmacy, no, no dental services, and really make a difference uh, in the homes of people. Um, so that's kind of the idea of community care medicine. There's a lot of different examples, especially in our community. Uh, to the west, uh, UNC Nash Hospital runs a program. Um, theirs is for a year or two, like folks being discharged from the hospital, following up with them. Uh, we also see programs in Pitt County, Wilson County, Nash County, and a couple others. But there's only about two or three of them in North Carolina that will have the same priorities as us. We'll talk about that. Um, so what do community paramedics do? Basically, um, it kind of comes down to three different areas for the most part. Number one, they're going to support the EMS system. So I'm another paramedic. Uh, I've got a vehicle. I'm mobile. Um, I was a road supervisor for two years under the direction of Mr. Brown in the back and had a blast doing that. Uh, but now, instead of managing a shift of 20 people, I, I have to manage myself. So I don't know if I lucked out or, or what to do with that. But um, I'm just another unit to help out when things get busy during times of disaster. But I also have a different focus, which is going into the, uh, the people's house for a good reason. Not always when they're uh, found their spouse unconscious on the floor, but going in and checking in with them, you know, week by week. Um, so I guess kind of a question you might think about is, well, how do you know where to go if nobody's calling you out and you don't, really know who the people are in the community, how do you know where to go? For now, uh, we have set up a referral process with our own EMS agency. Um, so when they do go to a house and they notice um, different types of issues, whether it be a mental health crisis, substance abuse problems, which is our, our main priority with the program, uh, a house that is falling in with people living there, that maybe is like a kind of a social services type issue, I can go in uh, visit with the patient, kind of see some needs. Uh, first thing I will do when I walk into the patient's house is open up the fridge. Uh, and not to fix me a snack, but really that gives me a good idea of kind of what that patient, kind of kind of where they're at. You know, if there's not much in the fridge, maybe a to-go plate, and that's about it. It gives me a good idea of, of you know, that patient's in trouble. And, and there's some serious needs that, that need to be met quickly in a hurry. Um, so that kind of shifts my head. Uh, like I mentioned, some of the different uh, versions that we see in this area, uh, the healthcare version, which is like post-hospital discharge, 
uh, keeping folks out of the emergency room, that type of deal. Uh, that is what you see with UNC Nash's program. They run like an eight to five traditional work week. They go out and they follow up with those patients who are at risk or going back to the hospital. Uh, CHF patients, COPD, a lot of the big you know, illnesses that cause you know, long lengths of stay in the hospital, and that really kind of saves the system some money there. Uh, the public health version, uh, which is kind of uh, what the health department is, is doing with the program here, is a lot of harm reduction strategies. So uh, think about like syringe exchange programs, uh, you know, really community distribution of Narcan, which we may get into a little bit about the opioid settlement. Um, and how that affects our program, but like a public health model. Um, a couple of years ago, there were community paramedics going into the community doing uh, COVID vaccine, doing clinics like that. And then lastly, the public safety version, this would be Nash County EMS. Uh, they want to free up their units. You know, we don't want uh, to go out to the same person's house 100 times a year to try to, you know, keep that unit in service. Um, alternative destination transport, so not everything, everybody needs to go to the emergency room. Some people are best benefited going to a mental health provider. Some people need to go to a doctor's office and kind of thinking about uh, what's best for the patient. So that's, that's the public safety plan. Our program here is going to be kind of a hybrid between all three of them. Um, I worked in Nash County for almost eight years. I was still in the community program there. And their community is a lot different than our community here. Uh, and I didn't know that walking in. I was like, well, you know, it's on a 20 minute ride, I'm going to deal with the same types of stuff, and that just wasn't the case. Um, so, we're going to make a program that's going to work for Edgecombe County. And we're going to mess up, we're going to do some things that don't make sense, uh, but then we're going to have the ability to check ourselves and, and, you know, take constructive criticism and do something that does make sense and, and it's going to best use those opioid and settlement funds. A couple of things I've noticed in Edgecombe County. Uh, according to the health assessment that was released not too long ago, was substance abuse disorder. Uh, so this is this is something that's killing our youth. Um, it's killing people's uh, friends, their families, their mothers, their dads, their, their cousins. Um, and substance abuse disorder, particularly opioid overdoses, are 100 percent preventable, and we have the antidote for that. Um, in EMS, we don't really have the antidote for, for much of nothing. Um, I, could, I could talk about a, a few, few different medications, but even laypersons now can, can prevent opioid-related deaths, and I think that's something that we should be passionate about. Um, lack of transportation. I figured if you lived in Whitaker's 20 miles from a grocery store, that you automatically just had a car park in your yard, and that's not the case. Um, so really being able to be mobile get into the patient's house, eliminates a lot of the barriers for transportation. So that's kind of a, a cool thing that EMS professionals get to do is, is we're mobile, we get to the house, and you don't have to come to us, we meet you where you are right now. So that's, that's a cool thing that we're gonna really use our benefit uh, for the program as well. Access to professionals, particularly mental health professionals. Um, I noticed that per 10,000 people we are almost, I don't know, 2,000% of where uh, we need to be. So, so mental health crisis affects, I'm sure everybody's got a family member um, that is affected before. So we take this seriously. It's not something we were really trained on in paramedic class, so I'm kind of figuring it out myself. But we're working uh, real close with Peace Point and uh, some of the LCEs and NCOs, I think, I think that's right, and then, uh, to, to hopefully target some of these, these folks as well. And then basically some other two things that are, are very common in Eastern North Carolina, poverty and health coverage, which uh, doesn't really matter to our program a whole lot. We're going to focus on the other three uh, per se. These are some of our community st uh, stakeholders and partners that we've set up meetings with, uh, some of the agencies that we're working with currently. Um, the program went live May 22nd, so we're, we're not even a month in right now, and we've already seen a lot of referrals come in. Um, and we, we've actually seen some patients that we're slowly starting to make a difference with. So it's kind of some, some good things, you know, definitely on the horizon, and we're seeing some good things with the program so far. So our solution uh, created a vision statement. It's over there in the palace. It's creatively improving health 
by dismantling barriers, like we mentioned, transportation, substance abuse, things of that nature, providing compassionate care, and integrating community-based support. Uh, another thing I noticed working in Nashville County was there's a lot of agencies uh, that help people in this, in this place. And that, that is something we're very fortunate to have. But the coordination of all of those is kind of where, where some of the struggles I've, I've noticed. So trying to, you know, really just make a resource list for myself. That way when I'm dealing with that patient who doesn't have a wheelchair ramp, know who to call. Um, so that's kind of what I've had to learn so far. And then providing compassionate care. We're going to come in. We're going to do our best. We're going to, we're going to make a positive difference in the patient's life. We're going, to, we're going to smile, we're going to be professionals, um, and, and we're just here to help people, whatever that looks like. A couple of the methods, uh, especially for the opioid settlement. Uh, basically, if, I'm sure everybody knows about the opioid settlement, but basically it's an 18-year uh, stretch of time where a, a lump sum of money is paid to every uh, county in North Carolina. Uh, I think it was the Johnson & Johnson lawsuit. I think it's where most of that's coming from. There's Exhibit A and Exhibit B, which basically tells you how to utilize that money. Um, and these are some of the Exhibit A strategies for those uh, that are familiar. Evidence-based addiction treatment. Here in Edgecombe County, uh, we work pretty close to Freedom Hill right up the road to hopefully get an idea of doing some medication-assisted treatment in the field, which is you know, not many counties in North Carolina is doing that. That makes uh, some, some medical directors, and especially my, my uh, immediate supervisor, Chad Easton, makes him kind of shake his boots a little bit, but I think it's something that uh, is good for the community. Basically what it is, is going to a patient's house who may have overdosed, get them on a medication that's gonna prevent their craving for that same uh, type of drug, get them enrolled in the MAT program, uh, such as Freedom View or something like that, hopefully uh, lead them down the road to recover uh, and how we can help you know, in that process we're going to do. So evidence-based addiction treatment such as MAT, community Narcan saturation and distribution. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen the, uh, the little thing that you spray in the nose. That's the reversal agent for opioid overdose. Making sure that's in the community. Uh, that way when somebody does overdose, that, that medication is readily available. Because if that medication is not given, that patient may not be breathing, and you know, not breathing is, is no good. Uh, within a couple minutes, you know, that patient will definitely have injuries to the brain and could even cardiac arrest. Uh, and that makes our job on the EMS side of things a lot harder, dealing with that cardiac arrest patient versus just somebody who's not breathing. Harm reduction and syringe exchange programs, uh, basically that's an idea to reduce the amount of local pathogen spread in the community. Um, if people are going to use drugs, typically they're going to use drugs. And if we can provide some type of clean environment that protects the community, uh, let's do it. So basically what that looks like is um, a lot of dirty needle usage is going on. Uh, it's going to be passing hepatitis C and things of that nature. Uh, kind of around the community. If we can get clean needles out there um, and really distribute a way to lock those needles up, we're hoping that you don't see them in the parking lot. They're not just thrown in a trash can. So we can kind of improve public health with that idea as well. A lot of these things have already been sent out by the state as approved methods. So we just kind of adopted some of them. Uh, we're kind of brainstorming to see what will work for our agency. Uh, what's going to work for the community, how we really are efficient, and how we're very intentional, I guess, about these particular programs. And then uh, the last one, access to telehealth and peer support. So we mentioned that there's not a lot of mental health positions in Edgecombe County. So linking up with some telehealth, especially out uh, toward the Greenville area, uh, we, we met with a, with a gentleman with EC Health about maybe doing some telehealth with a psychiatrist when dealing with behavioral health situations, substance abuse, things of that nature that are not maybe face-to-face here. Um, community paramedicine is mobile. Like we mentioned, we're going to the patient's house. It's prompt. Uh, I'm not available 24-7 all the time, uh, but I do take a lot of the 
work week type hours, and when something comes out, we're going right now. And that's what I've been used to. You know, EMS has been been what I've done for almost a decade now. When people, you know, call 911, they expect somebody to come out there in a prompt manner. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to be effective and then cost efficient. So basically, our focus, since we're getting our money from the opioid settlement, is going to be centered around substance abuse. However, that's not the only reason we would go into somebody's home. June the 1st, we opened up EMS referrals. So when our crews went into an environment that had a red flag, something's not right with this patient, um, they need some follow-up care, they sent that to me. Uh, I want to say we were sitting around the 20, the 20 mark, I think I checked this morning, of patients that's already been referred. So we're seeing almost one a day. Uh, and they, I've been able to follow up with almost half of that. Uh, the other half, we hadn't been able to communicate with. They, they uh, moved out of county. Uh, they're in the hospital now, they're in the facility. Different reasons, but I'd say that's, that's pretty good for now. Um, we're seeing about four of them on a regular basis every week. So, so that's good. I think we're pretty darn close to being, I mean, th this thing's about to bust loose, I think, uh, which is a good thing. It's a good problem to have. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So our message to those who do struggle with substance use is we're going to be ready with the tools when they're ready to, to use the tools. So basically, not everybody's path is going to look the same way to recovery. Um, so whatever that looks like that particular patient, Get up with us. We're here to meet you where you are, to provide low barrier effective care, and, and hopefully steer you in the right way, and, and just do what we can, to, like I said, to help you. That's what we're here to do. Kind of a timeline for, for my goals and ambitions. Uh, like, like I mentioned, the program was established May 22nd. We opened the referral process June 1st. I'm hoping that we can open the referral process to local clinics and hospitals on July the 1st. Uh, that's 10 days, well, give or take 10 days from now. I don't think that's going to work. We're probably going to have to bump that back a month, which is okay. Uh, we're going to have, you know, two bumps along the way. The MAT program launch, I'm hoping that this starts in September. There's a whole lot of uh, protocol revision and approval and things of that nature since we're doing kind of a creative program in this area that's not, not really done many other places. It, it still takes some time, so I'm, I'm trying to be patient myself, uh, but I do think that it's, it's definitely something that's going to that's happen but before 2024. I think that's a realistic goal. Hopefully we'll get another staff member, uh, whatever that looks like. In other places it's an addition of a community paramedic. Some places it's an addition of peer support specialists. Some places it's an addition of social work. I don't know what's going to work yet, so we're going to keep our eyes open and kind of see see how it works. Um, and then my goal is next May, we're going to do an evaluation on how we did, if we were good, if we were bad, if we were, might can, uh, improve in a different place, and then kind of steer the program from there. Hopefully by the end of next year, uh, the substance abuse program will really be off the ground and we'll have the coverage available 24 7. Here's a, just an overview of the Edgecombe County financial uh, opioid settlement in a graph. So over the next 18 years, we should be uh, around almost $2.7 million, uh, most of which come in the first couple of years. Uh, as you can see, the dark green up top, which I know the, the numbers are kind of hard to read, uh, those two payments have already uh, hit the bank accounts. And then the ones in green, which the 2023 settlement one, I don't, that one should be get, coming to release pretty, pretty shortly. So that one will turn dark green. So just kind of summarizing things, community care medicine is new, somewhat. EMS is new, really, around since the 70s. Um, we're going to have a hybrid between a lot of the different programs that are in our area. We're not going to be the same as Nash. We're not going to be the same as Pitt County, as any of those places. We're going to be Edgecombe County, because I think that's what we do best. We're going to be good stewards, and we're going to be transparent with the opioid settlement funds. I think that's that's a, you know, that's a big priority for me. And then really getting involved in our community 
networking with all those agencies that I listed on that one slide, being here in front of you guys, uh, that's crucial to really having a having a positive, uh, you know, positive program and, and really being efficient. So networking is kind of the crux of what we're doing. There's my contact information if you uh, need to get up with me and send me an email, call the phone. If you can't see it, it's 252-544-8155. And then the email is daltonbarrett at edgecomeco.com. And I'll take any questions you have. My question is this. That's wonderful information, but I'm, I'm fine to that. Okay. Could you send this to Ms. Kim and ask Ms. Kim to send it out to us? Yes, ma'am. Don't y'all act like y'all can see it. <laughs> If I didn't have my glasses on, I couldn't see you. I felt like I was miles up here. But, uh, well, I know, but yeah. and it was wonderful. One of my questions is this, and maybe you had it, and I was too busy trying to okay. read it. I could have that thunder. Um, did you list your goals for the program? Um, I listed some priorities and a vision statement. Okay. Uh, but my goals, I think that's a great question. Um, my goal is to, to prevent opioid related deaths. I guess that would be my goal, uh, since since that's the kind of the, where the funds are coming from, you know, in our in our values, kind of in the mission statement a little bit. I'd say that's my goal. So nobody in Edgecombe County should die from opioid related death. That's my goal. Is that realistic? Probably not. But that's one is too many, uh, especially since it's a reversible it's a reversible death. So. That's why I'm
uh, unconventional solutions in today's uh, world. So trying to be creative with that and seeing what we can do to, to make sure transportation is not affecting patient outcomes. Of course, one of the most important things about this is let's say someone uh, overdoses and out of that truck door that they slammed in the hospital, they have to take them somewhere. And then when they go back home, a lot of times they're there on their own flight and trying to figure things out. That's when Dalton can show back up and say, hey, you know, it's been referred to me and let me help get you connected to some resource. That's the follow up is, is, is missing. You know, our folks on these trucks pick, pick people up all the time and help to reverse that reversible death, you know. But it's when they get back home and they're struggling to stay connected to some resource you know, um, that hopefully this can make a future impact. Because otherwise what will happen is what's been happening. They're going back and picking up some of the same people over and over and over again. What problem is I think you did a 
also, as much as you know, family members, church members, people that you know in the community, if they are applying for any of our programs, but particular Medicaid, uh, uh, food stamps, as much as possible as people can use the online system. I know a lot of folks don't they want to show up, you know, they just want to see look somebody in the eye to do it. I want to hold that application. I understand that, but the the, it's, the more that people can do that, the little bit of pressure takes off when they're walking in traffic or in the office. And then the other thing is making sure that they have all the necessary information when they apply. Or, you know, if they're given a, a piece of paper that says you need to bring back this, this, and this, get it as quickly as you can and bring it all back. Because when our staff is trying to hunt down bits and pieces of information, it drags out the process and makes it that much uh, you know, more difficult for them to complete an application. That, that helps. So, you know, I think if, if everybody on both sides of the equation work hard, understand that this is uh, this is a situation that none of us have asked for and it's difficult on both sides, we can work together. I think we can get through it. We want to make sure that our citizens get the services that they are eligible for and they deserve to get. Um, and we're going to do our very best to try to make that happen as quickly as possible. Well, I think if you know of a senior citizen, especially if you're out in the country,
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, we've talked about this a couple of times before. I just want to, I guess, refresh your memories about this. You'll recall that um, we, we gathered some of our staff, some outside stakeholders um, in this room back in April. And we're looking at, I told I was sharing with you how uh, Mr. Carver used to talk about we we the top and bottom of all these bad lists and sick these lists. And so we took that and we boiled that down to our call to action, which is get off the list. And so what we did in this room was we, we looked at some of those lists. In particular, we looked at the um, we looked at the what they call the county health rankings, which they do that across the country, every state, every county in that state is compared to other counties based on a whole list of statistics and other things. And so, uh, unfortunately, in North Carolina, we are number 99 out of 100 counties in North Carolina based on those lists. So, we looked at all of those lists on that county health, health ranking. Uh, unemployment, poverty, it's a whole number of things. And so, what that group did was we, from those lists, we came up with the four focus areas, which are youth and family, uh, educational workforce development, health equity, and affordable and safe housing. We have these hanging over here because these are three, I'm not sure what it is, the graph is there, but we have these other three, we're, still, we're tier one county, we have the second highest, um, second highest tax rate in the state, and we are one of 51 counties in North Carolina that has a declining population per the 2020 census. So what we're doing now is we are looking at these four focus areas, and we're working on First of all, identifying what efforts are already underway that are working. I believe that you don't have to reinvent the wheel, that there are a lot of great uh, initiatives and programs and services that are available that are chipping away at these things. Some of them we do through our, our departments. Some of them are done by nonprofits or the agencies in the county, but they're doing great work. We just feel like we need to do more of that, right? Do multiply the good work that they are doing. So we have, under each of these categories, we are looking at, first of all, the list that relate to that particular category, the existing efforts, and then looking, are, are there any gaps? Is there anything missing that we need to try to create to help fill those gaps? So we're gonna be focusing on these four different areas. Our goal is to either create a task force for each one of these areas, or work with a group that's already doing work in that particular area. For example, under health equity, the uh, Edgecombe County Rural Health uh, Network, which is a partnership between our health department, uh, ECU Health, and, and many other people have been coming to the table for a while now. They're working on a lot of these things anyway. So uh, that group has agreed to basically cover that base because they're already doing that. So they'll be looking at strategies and, uh, and initiatives that we can do that over time will help move the needle in that, on, in that particular focus area. We're looking, we're exploring opportunities in the other three areas to see, is there an existing group that's composed of all the white folks that are already meeting, already working on a strategic plan, where we can just help work alongside them, so we're still working on that. The next step for us is that we need to hear from our citizens. First of all, we need to go out in front of our, our citizens and say, look, Edgecombe County is a wonderful place to live and work, but Edgecombe County has got some issues. We got to be realistic about that. We got to accept where we are, and then we got to be determined to work together to, to change that in the future. But also, um, not only just to say this, this is where we are as a county, but also to get some ideas, some feedback, and, uh, you know, some. Uh, strategies from our citizens say, well, I think maybe you need to think about doing this, or here's a program that you, you're not aware, aware of, but you need to, to, to think about supporting this thing that's working over here. So we're working on scheduling um, two in-person community engagement sessions. One will be here in Tarboro, one will be in Rocky Mount. Then we'll have a third one that will be virtual. We're going to start there. We may have others in the future. Hopefully we'll be able to nail those dates down soon. We're going to try to get that done between July and August. But we'll let you know and certainly invite you to attend either of those or all of those if you like. But we really need to make sure that we engage and, and get feedback from, from our citizens. So 
You're going to be hearing about this a lot. You're going to be seeing this a lot. I just want to keep this in front of you. Um, we are already allowing this to help um, help guide our budgeting um, decisions for next year. Um, there are some things that are in the proposed budget that our board has already heard about. Um, they will meet on the 26th to take a final vote on or take a vote on the budget. And there are some things that directly come as a result of some of these lists that we are looking at. For example, some initiatives that we're proposing under education and workforce development. And we'll be working with the community college to make some scholarships and some other things available to put some staff in place to help impact that high employment rate that we have. So we're going to use this internally as well to help uh, drive the budgetary decisions that we make, at least in those areas where we can make this. So, Again, I just want to keep this in front of you. Uh, I, I would encourage that as you see and hear about us doing work in relation to this, jump in where you feel like you can make some impact. Already you do by just by being on this board. But even outside of that, if you see, if you feel that one of these four areas, youth and family, education, workforce, development, home, health, equity, affordable, and safe housing, if that speaks to you and you have a burden to help make a difference in, in either of those four areas. Just be on the listen, uh, on the lookout for opportunities where you can jump in and help with this big lift because it's going to require a whole lot of people. We've got about 550 people that work for Edgecombe Camp, and even if every one of us work on this every single day, we can't do it on our own. But we can, we play a part in this, but it's gonna take, it's gonna take a lot of folks, a lot of uh, well-intentioned, uh, folks in Edgecombe County that want to see Edgecombe County be a different county in the future to commit to working on this in some way. I've also been putting out the challenge. I'll put it out uh, to you all as well. My challenge is, I guess my appeal, is that as you see where you can contribute to this, to make a commitment, and the commitment is to dedicate at least one hour of your week every week to doing something that's helping to move the needle on this. I've made a commitment of two hours per week. I put it on my calendar. Sometimes I'm in my conference room I'm working on this. Sometimes I'm in a meeting and that counts towards it. But I'm committing that at least two hours of my week every week is going to be dedicated to this because it's going to take a commitment of time, not just us every now and then getting together and talking about this and hoping it happens. We're just going to have to roll up our sleeves and make it happen. And we need everybody, we need all of you to help in that. And I'm going to be making this, I've already made this same appeal about four meetings already. I'm going to keep ringing this bell because it's going to take all of us working together, making a commitment over time to really change it from Canada. I believe it is absolutely possible. I don't think this is just a pipe dream, just a possibility. Oh, these are nice thoughts and wouldn't it be nice if I believe that this can actually happen. It's not going to happen in a few weeks, a few months, or even just a few years. But over time, it's gradual. We're going to get closer and closer to this vision. I believe that one day, Edgecombe County won't be a tier one county anymore. I believe that one day, we will not have one of the highest unemployment rates in the state. I believe that one day, we won't have the second highest tax rate in the state of North Carolina. And many other lists that either we're going to get off that list or we're going to move so, again, thank you for just listening to me preach that. I don't preach you when I get to talk about that. Uh, but I just want to keep that in front of you. I'm going to leave that slide up for a little bit just for you to look at it and associate it with you. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Should they want to uh, volunteer? Should they call you all? Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Can call hey, <laughs> Absolutely. Can we call you yeah. Absolutely. I mean, um, you know, there. If if you're not, you want to help, but you don't know what you can do. We can help you figure it out. But just to show you this, this gets real busy if I show the whole thing. But I look like under under youth and family. You can see that we have 
And this is not all of them. These are ones we thought of so far, but you can see we've got our DSS on this list doing great work. And that impacts this particular category. Boys and Girls Club, Rocky Mount OIC, uh, Rural Opportunity Institute, J JCPC programs. Ms. Harris serves on the JCPC committee. United Way of Tar River Region. So you have lots of opportunities where you may already be involved, and if so, just work with the part of where you are. Or other opportunities where you can jump in, whether we serve on the board, you know, participate in some of the planning sessions that we have, whatever it might be. Your your little piece might be, you know, I, I know folks at my church who looking for a job but don't know where to start. I'm going to take one hour out of my week this week to sit down and talk to them and show them the NC Works website where they can go and register and get their resume done, and then it will automatically start connecting them to jobs that are posted on that website. It can be something as simple as that. So there are lots of opportunities, but if you want to, if you want to jump in and be a part of this and you're not sure how, please give me a call. Be happy to sit down and talk with you through it and try to help you find some ways you can jump in. Eric, I noticed on our list about the what used to be me, which is now the Hedge Fund Nash Wilson uh, Community Action. They are now a new, right? Not me, but me. Right. sitting around sort of like what we're doing now and thinking, okay, who's doing work and in some ways already impacting one of these areas? So we know that, that both the libraries are already doing, uh, you know, a lot of things that are helping youth and families, and it might be over here on the workforce as well. Definitely, excuse me, there is some 
under workforce? Yes. Because we've got 23 computers. And since the pandemic, they're not really being utilized. Um, and as I say, people come in needing help to uh, apply for jobs, do their resumes, and all these other things. We have, I believe, we'll know. I don't know if many of the members know already. Most of them I have a chance to talk to them. 
this is the month that my term actually expires as the chair last expires with full direction. Two years from this month. Uh, that will be my last uh, time for the meeting. So with that in mind, we had I had conversations with several people. Uh, not everybody, I didn't get a chance to get up with everybody, but those that did call me or I called and we talked about what where they want to go and where we want uh, the board to continue going. Hopefully I get somebody that's much smarter than me, much faster than me, can do things more swiftly. So uh, we have agree, agreed, uh, in my, my choice, of uh, having our next chairman is going to be uh, Dr. Corbett. Uh, I can't say enough about Dr. Corbett that she stuck by my side from day one, square one, and never waited the entire time. Uh, she's done a lot, and I don't think anybody, I don't know anybody that will fit this deal any better than her being the next in line. She had agreed that she came to this, she would do this. She's always kept doing it the entire time. Her schedule is her job. She's had so many responsibilities. I don't think everyone's aware of that. And so it worked out well for us. I was just doing it with her. She was just taking on responsibility after responsibility. Now she's at the point where she thinks she can take it with the help of each and every one of you all and certainly move forward and uh, make the strong county a much better forward than it did when I started. I can say for instance, uh, I, I'm appreciative of this is the, in, in the order, I was there for the inaugural board, if you will. Uh, I think in 2013 is when we put this board together. Uh, I started out in the Department of Social Service in 2009. I worked, uh, it's been there, we worked there from 2009 to about 2013 until we uh, uh, became the Department of Human Services. And uh, certainly, uh, I think that was the best shot I can't thank Mr. Carmen enough uh, for what he done. We were tied to the hill at one point. We were back and forth here and then. I thought I was a full fledged county employee until I didn't get a check. And then uh, he told me, Yeah, you volunteered. I said, Okay, I'll, I'm in for, for the long haul. So, but Mr. Carmen, I can't thank enough of him. And it's just fitting that we're in this building now that's named after him uh, for all the things that he has done to help push this county forward. Uh, I could go down a list of things that we have accomplished since I have been here on this board. He's starting from uh, one, getting us a new county manager here, that's Mr. Eric Edwards. We got us a new health director, uh, Mr. Michelle Edwards. We got a new uh, DSS director, Mr. Ben Battle. Uh, we did a number of things that we have not really documented, put down to say, look, in chronological order, this is what we did. That's, that's good to help each one of you all. Every single one of you played a role in this. To some degree, and I, I'm appreciative of that. I'm reminded of a kid that was growing up, uh, started out in Edgecombe County, and got grew up with me, and I looked at him, and I always thought that, look, this kid might have something going on with his life. So I patterned myself after him. As we went through school, I looked at him, and I thought, well, hmm, if I could just be a little bit like him, you know. So as he went through school, he graduated from school, he got out of school and uh, joined the military, that I might follow that too, and uh, uh, got out of the military, started with the law. Started a family, the boys started out in the military, and a nice family, kept the family together. He did all these things, and then became a work in law enforcement for a while. Then I looked around, looked in the mirror, and I found out the person I was chasing followed was me. <laughs> so I became reality set in, and I said, Well, look, that is me, and that's what I want to do. And once I retired, I had a number of people find me things to do. Everybody had something for you to do, and the calls still come here from time to time. Uh, some of my friends, classmates, uh, which I'm dear to, uh, some county commissioners, so uh, classmate and friend there, so uh, and commissioner, um, they've all asked me to do certain things, and I've done all I can to make sure I'm helping make a difference in Edgecombe County, and I will continue to. Uh, this is not the end. I want you all to know that this is just a new page. We're trying to turn a new page, get a new body in, in place, and do some things. I'm forever grateful for every single one of you all. Not only just you all, but those that were on the board prior to this, uh, prior to you all, some of the people on here coming on. Uh, it's been a job, it's been a friend that you might think you learned something from me, but trust me, I learned more from each one of you all than you will ever learn from me. And uh, that's what drives me, what motivates me to do the things that I do. I'm Edgecombe County 4, Edgecombe County 3, and I'll be Edgecombe County until I'm Edgecombe County D. So that's just the way it is. Some people Let me hold on that one. <laughs> well, with the time comes, the next thing to do is we figure out a way to keep it from happening. Let me know. Okay. You're in the medical field, you might have something. I don't think Narcan will do that. I think Narcan will do that. But 
I would, I do appreciate it. And I can't thank each one of you all enough. I thank each one of you personally, collectively, and as a group, you know, here throughout the county. Uh, that's just it. So, uh, in the future, I think what we'll do, and if uh, Mr. Eric, uh, Mr. Eric is okay with it, we will, uh, uh, as of the 30th of this month, I will not be an official member of this board, but uh, definitely going to, my nomination is going to be this Dr. Court, without a doubt. And uh, what I'll do is participate and help her with those times until such time we have a meet, we can either do a special call meeting, like in a month, or we'll just wait till the August meeting to make sure we get a quorum. We only miss one person. We have one person who can take care of this tonight. But you know me, I like to follow the protocol, follow the rules, and we make sure that we uh, use the, follow all the laws that we have in meetings, and that we got to announce it in advance and let people know so they can be in time. And it's unfortunate we would not be able to. Dr. Knight would have been here, but unfortunately she had a meeting over in Princeville at the same time. So that would have been another person for us. But sometimes we have to learn to improvise, adapt, and overcome. And uh, I, we've done that a number of times, and I've enjoyed it. <coughs> and I, once again, I'm not leaving you all. I'm just moving to another side. I'll be continuing the DSSB under the direction of our worthy chair here, uh, Dr. Mrs. Dr. Ms. Harris, Commissioner Harris, so we'll, uh, I'll still be around, so I can help you with anything from that perspective, let you know. I also want to thank my family, you know, my son, Tyree, who decided he can look this day, he can come out and hang out with me. I'm forever grateful for that. Um, I'm grateful for all of my family, because they're the ones who supported me and helped me get where I am today. So, thank you all again. Thank all the people in all the county, especially all the workers there. Y'all do a great job.
out the field. So we are looking forward to uh, Ed Strong and Alex continue doing the work that you have uh, both continue to push hard for the citizens of Ed Strong and Thank you all again.
see how you have done and uh, appreciate the work that you continue to do here. Certainly, uh, the town, uh, county manager, I appreciate what you've done. I mean, I think I might have been responsible for you getting this job, but that's okay. That's okay. I won't, you don't have to send a check later on. But uh, we appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Carmen and I, we talked a lot about, we were talking about the, um, the DSS and the board were having issues with that at one time. We could, I could understand how DSS could be a part of a county, but was not disciplined or controlled by county. The, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? The, the personnel. The personnel, the personnel is all we did was, was the state was telling the people how to run the county. And it just didn't make sense to me. So that was one, one of the reasons why we ended up with the human services board. And a lot more counties are starting to take on. I don't know how many counties we have in the state now. The last I checked, there was about four or five. Yeah, it's probably about like seven. Yeah, but they don't start from Mecklenburg County, Wayne County were the primary two. And then that's about, and the other counties are picking up on it now doing so. We may be a premier doing it, but we thank you all. I want to thank Kim for all the work she does, and day to night, and that last minute return has changed this, fix our food, we didn't get enough, we didn't get enough, we didn't like this, we, she put up with it all. So thank her very much for all the work you do, and thank all of you. Once again, thank you all, and this meeting is adjourned. We have some refreshments, ladies, partake, take some with you. So that meeting, we also need We had to do it at that meeting. Yeah, we should meet there. Yeah, we get to meet this program.